Hello, everyone. Welcome to the May 2012 edition of the Professor Messer User Group Study Group for A+. We're going to do A+, this afternoon. For those of you watching live today, we're at a little bit of a different time of the day. I'm getting over a bit of a cold. So I adjusted the schedule around, and I really appreciate everybody being flexible with their schedules. I had to cancel at the last minute last week. Now, if you're watching the, the replay of this, of course, none of this even matters to you. But uh, for those of you who made it live, I sure appreciate it. Having you live and available in the chat room, I think, makes it better for everybody. And uh, certainly for the the, the purposes of doing this and sitting here for an hour and talking, it's easier for me as well. So I really appreciate it. Uh, we can probably get rid of our lower third that says we will begin shortly because here we are in the user group. This uh, The study group session that we do is one that we do every month. And it's really your support that allows this to happen. As many of you are realize, I have these videos that we put out, and every single video is available to watch for absolutely free on the internet. But of course, people that purchase this to watch offline are a big reason why we're able to do this every month. So we appreciate the people also that have, have purchased the product. I send DVD ROMs to them. You're able to watch them offline. You don't need an internet connection. I include MP3 files and HD versions of every video. And if you'd like to see more about that, you're welcome to have a look. You can go to professormesser.com slash download dash A plus. So thanks again for everyone to be able to do that. So let's start with an announcement. For those of you that were on our previous Network Plus study group, the announcement was 7 million. Earlier this week, ProfessorMesser.com passed 7 million videos viewed of our training materials. And it was just a phenomenal thing to see the counter flip over. Now, obviously, it was a normal week for us. We did our normal videos. We produced our content. We stuck it on the internet. The normal type of things went on. The, the sun came up, the sun went down. But it's really nice to have a little bit of validation that people are indeed enjoying and watching these things. And I get such great emails and letters every day. I, it's hard to reply to every single one of them. I apologize if I've missed anyone. But it's nice to also get some validation that some of the things we're doing here are indeed helping you with what you're doing there. So we'll just keep doing them. We'll keep making videos. We'll keep putting them on the internet. We'll wait until we go to 8 million and 9 million and 10 million and et cetera. So we're having a lot of fun doing this. As long as you keep watching, I'm going to keep making videos. So I wanted to send my thanks and my appreciation for getting us to the 7 million mark. It is quite impressive, and I could not be more grateful to all of you. Now, if you're watching this and you already have your a certification, you may be interested in knowing that this works towards credits if you plan to use credits to renew your a certification. So you may want to find this if you do a Google search for your CompTIA a CEU document, you'll get this frequently asked questions file. The entire URL is here right at the top. So you could always go out to that very, 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 very long URL, or you just Google it, you will find it. There's a whole page set up at CompTIA just for the continuing education units. And by watching this particular webinar, seminar, online user group, you get also credit for what you're doing. You simply tell CompTIA, yes, I did some of this and get some nice credit out of that. So something to consider. Now, the, what we do in this user group, this, this study group session, is I take your questions all month long. And I have a huge database that's full of your questions. Anytime somebody registers for this, I ask you not only for your registration information, but give me a question. And so I'm able to get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of questions coming in that I'm able to go through and see things that might be unique and see things that might be patterns. And I tend to put these together. Now, some of the things that are in this study group, uh, we talked about in previous study groups. Some of this is brand new. I try not to repeat month after month. So if you go back to last month's, you'll find that all the content is very, very different. So that's something to also keep in mind when working with uh, these study groups. But one of the questions that I first got uh, was something that uh, that I got that I thought, well, that's a that's a pretty good question. Let's let's ponder that one. And the question was, Pepsi or Coke? Now, obviously, this is not an A plus question, but I'm asking you Pepsi or Coke for a particular reason. Uh, what we do in these study groups, if you followed us the last few weeks or so, is we set this up so that you are able to participate and answer questions in real time with me. So what I'd like to do is 
move over to this slide. We're going to load up a question on the screen. Pepsi or Coke? And you get to answer Coke, Pepsi, or I threw in my favorite, Dr. Pepper, or Diet Dr. Pepper, which is my favorite. And now you get to vote. So if you go to pollev.com slash messer, you will be able to vote right now. You can also text this code that's next to these to 37607 if you're in the United States, or you can add poll on your Twitter and do that as well. And then you're able to, uh, you're able then to, to vote. We've got nine results so far. Now what's nice about this is we get to see it in real time. I'll just pull up the chart right now. Look, look at that. We're able to see immediately what that, what's going on there. Yeah, I didn't put water on there. Nielsen, I should have done that. Should have added some extra options, a none of the above. Or as they're saying in the other chat room, Heineken, uh, the Canadians are saying Canada dry. I don't know if you're Canadian or not. I just threw that in there. But notice how we're able to get this interactive feedback of what's going on. This can be really, really useful. In fact, let's, let's use this right now. Let's take advantage of this technology to have you tell yourself a what, what you are doing with A+. Plus. Let me know what you're doing with A+. Plus. Let's go to our, our next question on the list and slide it over right there. Our next question is something that I can use. So the question is, how long have you been studying for the A+, plus exam? Something that I want to know about. And that is something that, that's very, very important that I know is how much have you? How much time have you spent studying for this? Because I've got a whole study group session set up with content and materials. Look at that. Now we're able to get a lot more feedback in real time of what's going on. Isn't that great to see? So go to pollev.com slash messer to answer those. And you can also, of course, the other submitting of the code via, via SMS or via Twitter can also be done there as well. So a few things you can work on to, to see some of those things. Now, as we're going through this study group, I'm going to have chat rooms available uh, on the Professor Messer website slash live is a chat. That's also got an IRC option there. I've got the, looking at that on my screen. There's also a live study group chat room that I opened up on the Professor Messer website at the bottom. I'm looking at both of those. So you don't have to repeat yourself. I have all of that up on my screen. I'm able to watch it in real time of what's going on. So of our 21 results so far, one to three months, 24% of you have been studying for one to three months, 33% for three to six months, and then 29% more than 12 months. And this is one of those certifications where people tend to get into it and then something happens in their life, they have other things going on, and then they might come back later. That happens quite a bit. I get a lot of emails about that. So we're really got a lot of different levels of experience on the study group today. And I'll try to focus across the board on a lot of these things. We don't have to spend a lot of our time on the rudimentary end. We don't have to be too technical, but there is a happy medium in there somewhere to be able to work with those pieces. So let's start with some of those. The first thing, though, is I'd like to give you some practical information. We had this segment on our last study group, and I liked it, which was the interview tip of the moment. So many of you are getting this certification so that you can go out and get a job in IT. I thought that would be great. We will put together for you some tips for interviewing. This is one that I got, I think it was in our uh, our Professor Messer chat room that's up 24 hours a day, seven days a week on the Professor Messer website right there at the bottom of your screen. And this was a link which was the 10 best interview questions to ask. No, it was a Twitter feed. I got this off Twitter and uh, got the link there at yhoo.it slash kyzn 8 It's an O, not a zero. So use that. Oh, this is the 10 best interview questions to ask from the U.S. News and World Report. And it had some great interview questions in there of what to go through. Let's load that up. Let's let's have a look at that. I'm going to kind of slide over to this. Let's grab that link. So we're doing this live. Why not? Why not try out uh, some of our capabilities here? Let's load up that link. <clears throat> This takes us, here's some of the questions. Because you always get that part of the interview where they say, so do you have any questions for me? And here's 10 questions you can ask. What are the biggest challenges the person in this position will face? What would a successful first year in the position look like? See, you're already thinking about your first year already. You're letting that interviewer know, oh, I'm already in there. I'm already in the seat. How would you describe your management style? I don't know if I'd ask that question. Sometimes I don't want to know. Uh, how would you describe the culture here? Thinking back to the person who you've seen do this job best, what made their performance so outstanding? And now you've got some insight. Plus, you now have already expressed how interested you are. 
So already you have that that really difficult question they ask. Any questions for me? Never say no, I do not have any questions for you. That's my number one tip. Always say, oh, absolutely. Boy, do I have questions. Let's sit a spell. Let's let's talk about the questions that I have. Never say that you have no questions. You should absolutely have questions about this. Some of these questions will be organic. Some of these will be be, be normal uh, that you have about the position. You're just going to want to know more about it. Uh, but that that was one uh, I thought was a really good article that describes some tips and some ideas that you can use. Very, very useful. Uh, let's now go to the questions you've sent me. So during this particular month, I've gotten all those questions from you, and I've compiled a number of those questions together into a list that we can go through here today. So the first one I have is... How do you know if your CPU has hyper-threading technology? Jason sent this one in. And that's a pretty good question because, of course, not all CPUs have hyper-threading. And you may want to know if your, your CPU does. Well, first, let's take a step backwards. Let's talk first about what hyper-threading technology really is. You may see this abbreviated as HTT. And, uh, and in the chat room, somebody said, well, just look at the manual. Look at the specs. RGPG says, yeah, just look at the manual. So I don't know where my manual is. And sometimes you have these computers, you're not even quite sure what they are. Maybe they were put together by someone else. You don't even know what the specifications are. And sometimes the specifications don't tell you it, what the CPU functionality is. It only tells you what kind of CPU it is. So this is the place where you can go. There's a couple of ways. Plus, can you trust the documentation, there's a couple of ways you can confirm this. Hyper-threading technology, by the way, has been around for quite some time. Been around since 2002, I think all the way back to looking at the Pentiums, I think we're using HTT. And of course, we are still using it today in the latest Intel CPUs, the i5s, the i7s. They use hyper-threading. So there's some nice capabilities here to be able to do this. What this does is have your one physical CPU that you have in your computer to your operating system, looks like it's really two CPUs. It, it looks exactly as if there are two CPUs or two cores or two processors to doing things at the same time inside of your system. And if you look, there's there could be there's multiple cores with multiple threads going on. The four core Intel i7, there are eight threads that are really going on inside some of those boxes. It effectively doubles up. So this may not even be a thing where one processor looks like two. In the case of the four, the, the quad core i7, four processors looks like eight. I can process eight things at the same time. A lot of good, interesting things going on. Now, some people say, well, let's go out to the task manager. We'll look at the performance. It'll bring up two CPU views. But is it really two CPUs or is it hyper-threading? It's hard to tell. The CPU, the operating system doesn't know. Operating system's invisible to some of that functionality. This is a, a CPU function. So how are you supposed to really know what's going on? The nice benefit of this, by the way, is the speed. One of the problems or challenges you have is that you have a lot happening inside of your system, and it's moving very, very quickly. The thing is that your processor is going even faster. So there's, there's information coming from memory. It's going into your CPU. Your CPU processes that information, sends it back to memory. Now, while it's going back and forth between memory, out to the memory controller and back and forth, there's time the CPU's waiting. CPU's thinking, I could be doing something right now. I could really be working on this. If only I had virtualized myself and told the operating system, keep stuff coming. I could start to send stuff through the same CPU that's sitting there idle. I could still do another thread's worth of stuff. So yes, you could have multiple cores, like two cores or quad core, but many more threads going at the same time. This is pretty important. Cores is not hyper-threading. You take a single core, and you can have it look like two. That's fantastic. I can absolutely use that technology and speed up my system. You're going to get about a 30% increase in efficiency according to some of the benchmarks. Some of the benchmarks are better. Some of the benchmarks are worse. That's a pretty good number of what's there. Now, the real question, of course, is how do you know if you have this in your system? especially if it's relatively invisible to the operating system. There are utilities, however, in your operating system or that you can load on your operating system that can see this. One of my favorites is CPU-Z. CPU-Z really, really useful because it will tell you everything you would ever want to know about your CPU more than you would ever want to know about your CPU. 
And you can see right here that you can see that the type of CPU you have, an Intel Mo Mobile Core 2 Duo. I've got uh, the type of technology that's running, the voltage inside of that. I can see the family model stepping, uh, extended information, clock information, et cetera, et cetera. And at the bottom, you can see there are two cores in this Intel dual core, obviously two cores. How many threads can be processed at a time? Two threads. That is not doing hyper-threading. That is simply a dual core processor with multiple physical CPU cores. Hyper-threading is taking a single core and making it look like more than that. So if we look over here to the right, this CPU-Z is on an Intel i7. This is a, also a dual core i7. There are many different models of i7, but that one is a dual core. And this, uh, this is one where I can look through same information, Intel i7, 860, the Linfield, et cetera, et cetera. At the bottom, the processor, there are two cores, but there are four threads that can go through. Hyper-threading is something that is enabled and operational on that particular dual core i7. So there you go. That's how. That's one of the ways you would know that it supports hyper-threading. And now, obviously, other people in the chat room have already said, if you know what's in the machine, you can also go look at the specs for that. So if you know what processor is inside of that system, and CPU-Z, which is a Windows-only program, CPU-Z will tell you exactly what processor is there. You can always go to the processor manufacturer site and find out, does this support hyper-threading? Now, hyper-threading is an Intel feature. So you're going to see this on Intel CPUs. Other processors have similar functionalities that they use, but you'll also hear that word hyper-threading is specifically associated with Intel CPUs. Um, if this is a Macintosh, well, Mac OS X or Mac OS X is not part of the A plus certification, but you, there are ways to go in and look at details of CPUs there and be able to, to see that piece of it. So a very interesting question. And of course, I, I saw the question thought, how would I see hyperthreading? That's a very good question. How would I go about doing that? Because I just know if it does or it doesn't. You kind of you kind of keep that in mind when you're working with it. You're looking at your specifications. You're looking at the cores, and you got two cores, and you only see two in the the Windows uh, Task Manager. Well, then obviously the Performance tab. There's only two, but the i7, especially that Model i7, two cores, four threads. Aha, we're doing hyperthreading. So good question. Appreciate sending that one in. So Victor sends me another question that says, where would you find the BIOS file in order to back it up? Oh, somebody who obviously has had problems with the basic input-output system, the BIOS of their computer in the past, and has wanted to back up that con configuration file. Well, there's a few things that are important to know. One is that the configuration file of the BIOS isn't really something we have access to. It's not like in a file system that we traditionally think of, at least not with the current flavors of BIOS that we tend to have on our existing systems. But, but first, let's back up a bit and talk about the BIOS. Because this is a BIOS is really software. This basic input-output system is really software inside of your computer that manages to get your system up and running checks out your system, gets your hard drives available for your operating system, makes your keyboard available for your operating system, takes the hardware and has it interact with the OS itself. Now, every computer that's out there has to start up in some way, whether it's this existing BIOS that we tend to see on most everything these days, but usually the BIOS software is stored in a ROM, a read-only memory that's on the motherboard. This isn't something that's on your hard drives, not something that's on the traditional memory. It's not something you can, you can replace your hard drive and your BIOS goes away. Your BIOS is on a chip that's on your hard drive. Today, it's generally an electrically erasable, programmable read-only memory. You can flash it and you can flash your BIOS and upgrade your BIOS that way. Used to be the, the ROMs were a ROM chip. You had to physically remove the chip from the motherboard and put a new ROM chip on the motherboard to upgrade the BIOS of the computer. Thankfully, we don't have to do that anymore with those pieces. And what you're doing with your BIOS configuration is you're configuring how your system is, is set up. 
So the software loads up and says, okay, what are you running? Do you have uh, floppy drives? Do you have hard drives? Do you have a keyboard? How much memory is in the computer? How much is uh, going on with, uh, with hard drives? What type of hard drives do you have? A lot of the configuration settings of your computer are configured using the software. And once you've configured it, it has to store those configuration settings somewhere. And it configures and it stores them in this complementary metal oxide semiconductor called CMOS. The CMOS is generally this non-volatile memory that is on your computer. And it is something where you can store this information and it's there and available. And it's usually refreshed with some power that's backed up there on the system. And you can you can update that bio that BIOS uh, information can be updated at any time. You can read it and write it using your BIOS software. That configuration is generally going to have the hardware config of your system. So it, it's really not very much data. It's a very, very tiny bit of data, but it's very important data. Generally, this is something that's integrated now right into the Southbridge. You store your BIOS information, the BIOS configuration into effectively the Southbridge. So it's not even a separate chip anymore as a place to store that data. Very, very small, 128 bytes of content. Very, very tiny to store all of that data. So obviously, don't need a lot of room. We'll just stick it on some existing chips. Now we're good to go with the BIOS piece. Now the problem, of course, that, that configuration data, not really easy to get to. Not anything that you can grab, not any file that's available. Generally, the only place you can see it is in the BIOS configuration setup program. Let's go back to that previous slide and see that. So this setup program that you have, usually where you see it. Now, some BIOS setup programs have some type of methodology to, to, to export and import that, but not many do. Generally, you sit there with your mobile phone and you take a picture of it. There's your backup. Click. Let's go to the next screen for advanced. Click. Let's go to the next screen for security. Click. The next screen for power. Click. It's a very quick and easy way to back it up. Of course, you can write it all down as well and have at least a backup. But the reality is these days, almost all of it is automated. It is automatic. It's easy to automatically know what your hard drives are. There's there's hardware built into the hard drives that tells the BIOS the type of hard drive that it is. In the, in the very, very distant past, we used to not have automated ways. You had to manually configure everything in your BIOS setup program. And if you got it wrong, it didn't work. It was a problem. These days, practically everything's automated. So not a huge emphasis behind doing backups of your BIOS, not something you really have to worry too much about any longer. These days, make sure you just know the basic config of the system, and I bet you're going to be just fine with that. So let's let's move into another question I got. And this question was one that kind of came in um, as, as a way to test our knowledge of acronyms. I get a lot of questions about how to remember all these acronyms. Mm, Got to memorize them. Kind of hard to know what all those numbers and letters and names and things stuck together are. The question this month or the TMA, which is this month's ac acronym, is let's have a question. We're going to answer this question. Don't answer in the chat room. You must answer online. So what technology uses SMART or is, or is it as written S-M-A-R-T. It's actually written S-M-A-R-T. This is not only an acronym, it's an acronym that is an abbreviation. It's more of an abbreviation than an acronym, I guess. But we usually call it SMART. We usually call it an acronym, even though it's an abbreviation. So what technology uses S-M-A-R-T? Go out to pollev.com slash messer and vote. Is it memory? Is it hard drive? Is it video? Is it operating system? Or is it the keyboard that uses S-M-A-R-T? No cheating, no Googling. Answer or don't answer is fine. Got 14 results in. I'm going to wait another couple seconds, and then let's see what people have said they think S-M-A-R-T happens to be. And our results are, well, you guys aren't fooled at all. You all know the abbreviation S-M-A-R-T has something to do with the hard drive. And uh, our GPG in the chat room even says, well, the old BIOS would even ask you whether your hard drive had smart technology. So it's it's true. That's one of those things that now we just sort of take for granted. But in the old days, we didn't have this smart stuff stuck in our hard drive. These days, pretty much all the hard drives, they've all got smart these days. And most 78% of you weren't fooled by the question. 
Uh, some of you said memory and video. Nobody, almost nobody said video. Zero people said video. Operating system and keyboard. But SMART stands for the Self-Monitoring Analysis and Reporting Technology. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we knew when a hard drive was going to fail? Wouldn't that be great if we had some type of insight, if our hard drive could speak to us and tell you, yes, your hard drive is failing, back up quickly, get a new hard drive? It can. It can absolutely give us feedback like that, and we use SMART to be able to do that. If you want to read an absolutely intriguing article, this is one called Failure Trends in a Large Disk Drive Population, and it was one written by Google. Google had tons of hard drives. Well, they still do, obviously. They had this enormous number of hard drives, and what they did was watch them, look at the SMART statistics, and be able to determine based on that, if there were any trends associated with it. Now, the SMART is something that runs all the time. It's part of your drive. Whether you're looking at it or not, your drive's keeping track of it. It does has nothing to do with the data, has nothing to do with your partitioning, has nothing to do with anything. So this is a great type of feedback to get. So you can go out to this, this disk failure, failure trends in a large disk population. But here's what they found. Two things I want to share with you. There are many, many things in this art in this document they did. We find, for example, that after the first scan error, that's a very specific kind of smart error, the scan error. After the first scan error, drives are 39 times more likely to fail within 60 days than drives with no such errors. If you get a scan error, back up your drive and wait for 39 times the, the normal case of failure for in the next 60 days, in the next two months for that particular drive. That's pretty powerful. Very, very nice. So another thing they found though, you know, that's an interesting correlation they found. But one of the things that they I would find more interesting is that despite these strong correlations, we find that failure prediction models based on smart parameters alone are likely to be severely limited in their prediction accuracy given a large, a large fraction of our failed drives had no smart errors whatsoever. Just went boom failed. So although SMART can be a very, very, very good feedback for you on how your drive is performing and the health and the welfare of that particular system, it's not a guarantee that you're going to stop it from crashing. Always have a backup. Always have a backup. Did I mention that you should always, always, always have a backup? I don't care how you do it. Microsoft has built in a perfectly fine imaging backup program into your system. There are many, many absolutely free backup systems available and out there. So very, very nice to have that there. Smart is extremely useful, though. So if you happen to see that first scan error, boy, oh, boy, you're going you're gonna to have some things there. So use your NT backup or your Windows backup restore. Backup and restore has a great imaging system built right into it that will allow you to backup your entire system, have it right there and available to you. There's a, another absolutely free program you can use. This is Crystal Disk Info, all one word. And you can find that at crystalmark.info. That will keep track of the smart errors that are on your computer. Very, very useful to have as well. There are many, many free programs and also some commercial programs that will sit on your system and constantly monitor the smart statistics so that they will tell you, whoa, we just saw something really bad. Maybe you want to back up right now. We just saw a scan error. You got 60 days because you're 39 times more susceptible now to a failure, that type of thing. Some really nice commercial programs out there. If you go out to uh, Wikipedia and you Google, are you Wikipedia smart? Go out to Wikipedia and Google something. Go out to Wikipedia and look at the article for smart. And it will tell you a huge list of all the programs that will do this. So uh, so very, very useful. In the chat room, uh, it's me, AJ says, have you ever forgot to back up and regretted it? I have. It was a long time ago. I don't do that anymore. I don't lose anything. In fact, I thought I lost an entire external, at the time, I think it was an 80 gig hard drive. I had all my pictures on it. Um, and it, and I got the click of death. You know, you turn it on, it goes click, 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 click. I thought, oh no, that's not good. Uh, but I kept trying it, kept trying it, let it cool down, came back, kept turning on, and then it hit one time. It worked. The incident worked. I took the whole drive, dumped it to something else, backed up very quickly. I back up all the time. I back up constantly, constantly, constantly. I'm creating constant con 
constantly I'm creating content. I have an image backup that I do, and I have an incremental backup that I do, separate drives, and I have drives that go in and out, in and out, in and out, trying not to lose anything. I keep stuff on the cloud. I keep things stored on my on my servers that are outside of my facility. A lot, a lot going on there. Now, um, SSDs in the chat room, people are saying, what about Solid state, solid state. You don't have a lot of these worries. You don't have a lot of worrying about the 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 platters not spinning. You don't have a lot of worries about the hard drive head moving back and forth and trying to find the data. So a lot of the things on an SSD are uh, are very useful. SSDs. We used to be really worried that that they would fail too early because you can only read and write and really only write so many times to a solid state drive. But the latest versions of solid state drives. Uh, even with a very, 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 very busy amount of reading and writing, uh, they have some that are in firewalls. They're constantly writing logs, and they're they're like five years is what they expect those particular SSDs to last, well beyond the the lifetime of one of those particular pieces of hardware. Uh, I've been running an SSD in my laptop for almost two years now, like a champ. It runs. I uh, couldn't do without it. I would not go without an SSD just because of speed. I do so much video. So if you're doing a lot of editing, you need that speed. SSD is very nice. I, it's traveling around. I don't have to worry about bouncing my hard drive. I don't have to worry about those smart stats. But if you still have a traditional hard drive or those smart stats, they can really, really, really help you quite a bit. Okay, one of the questions that came in from Walter, I thought was a good one, just from a functional perspective. Not really sure. It's a little bit of, of A-plus functionality or things you should know about this. Uh, but the question was, how do you get drivers for a fresh installation of an operating system? Well, of course, you go into your drawer down here that you've been so good to keep everything that ever came with your computer. And it's all organized. And it's, and it's exactly where it should be. And it's the drivers and utilities disk of the drivers and utilities already installed on your computer for reinstalling for your specific computer model. There you go. All done. See how easy that was? Now, how many people still have this around somewhere? I'm not even sure how I found mine. And quite honestly, it's for a computer that, um, that I am still using, but it's not the same operating system. So you know what? You know when you change operating systems, you know how good the drivers are that you used to have? Not at all. Worthless. Not useful to you at all. So you're going to need to do something to be able to get to this particular driver. And almost always, when you need a driver, you go to the manufacturer's website to find that. Let's do some live stuff here. Let's since we're since we're in the mood, let's do an example. Well, I hit the wrong buttons. So I did a search for Dell rather than to go to Dell.com. That's okay. Google's smart enough to tell me where it is. So let's say we have a Dell computer and we need the drivers for this Dell. So you're going to need to know the model of the system that you are trying to find. And let's say we have a Studio 1735, which is what I think I have, 1735 something. And we need Windows 7. We'll go with the latest stuff. Windows 7 drivers. So right at the top, you have to figure out for whatever manufacturer's computer you have, you got to find out how to get to support. Here's technical support right there at the top. I mean, you can't see it because my head's in the way, but we're going to choose that. And Dell's going to say, okay, is this a home user? Well, I am a home user. You might be a big business. You might be something else. Um, now, one of the challenges you might have, what if you built the computer yourself? What if somebody else built the computer for you? It's not a Dell. It's not an HP. It's not something you buy off the shelf. Well, that's a little bit more of a challenge. You need to know what motherboard is inside of that system. It may require taking the cover off, looking at the motherboard itself. There are other pieces of heart of software that can also go in, even things like MS Info 32, or you can go to uh, other operating system sites that have these operating system tools. There's a lot of different kinds. We saw CPU-Z out there was one example of that. That same company has a lot of utilities that will find the hardware inside of your system and tell you what it is. But hopefully you have a way to go to the manufacturer's site. Drivers and downloads is one of the links right on the page. And you can go right to the driver's list. And they'll take you through the view of, okay, what do you have? Do you have a service tag? No, I don't. I don't have a service tag. I want to choose from a list of all Dell products. I'm sure this would be very, very easy to do. Oh, look, they show little pictures. This happens to be a laptop, so we'll choose laptops. This is, I said it was a studio, so let's click studio. And let's choose the 1737. This is the one that Windows 7 shipped on. 
And it says, well, what do you need? Select your operating system. It's Windows 7, 64-bit. That is the version for that. English is the language I need. Find drivers and downloads. There you go. And here are the drivers and downloads list for that particular system. So if I was had to reinstall Windows 7, I had to upgrade to Windows 7, that's where I would go to find some of the drivers that I need to be able to do those types of things. Very, very useful to do that. Um, and, and you're going to have to find each manufacturer's websites a little different. One of the challenges I had was that I had a Studio 1735. Let's do this again. Let's go back and look at this different system. I had a 1735, and I needed Windows 7 drivers. Watch this. Studio 1735. It says, great. What operating system? Windows Vista 32-bit or Windows Vista 64-bit? None, none of those. I need seven. I need Windows 7 drivers for my hardware, Mr. Dell. Please give me Windows 7 drivers. They never created Windows 7 drivers for the Studio 1735. So two years after I had purchased and paid for that particular laptop, I could only run Windows Vista on it. How do you like that? So that's one of the challenges you have. What did I do? I went to the 1737 and I downloaded all their Windows 7 drivers. Worked great. Completely unsupported by Dell, but it worked fantastic. There was no reason Dell couldn't do that. They didn't want to support Windows 7 on that particular hardware. And uh, not that Dell's, Dell has perfectly good hardware. I just won't be getting another one of those now because of that. I, I like their servers. I like the stuff you can put in a rack. Wasn't real happy with the experience I had going to Windows 7. Finally got it working, though. So, yes, very happy. Very happy that that's there. So it was a good question, too, about where you get those drivers from. And if you're going to be loading operating systems, putting those things on there, right there, you can find all of those pieces and have them available to you. Let's go back to our presentation. And... Another question I got was from Daniel this month that said, do I need other materials besides the free videos from Professor Messer to take the exam? And this is a question I get a lot because I put these free videos out on the internet. They say, great, so I don't need anything else, right? I just watch the videos, take the test. And I always say, mm, that's, a, that's not the best line of attack. You should, you should line up every possible thing you can think of to help you study. And at a bare minimum, I say, get Get my videos, watch the videos. They're absolutely free. Watch them as much as you like. Get a good book. Get something that has been through a vetting process. If it's a CompTIA certified book, all the better, because then CompTIA has looked at it and they verified that it's a good book. I also like Q&A. I, li I like a book that has questions in it, or I like some type of, of question and answer that I can go through. I'm not talking about brain dumps. Brain dumps are bad for you. Brain dumps will will cause you to be uh, to be stupid. Don't use brain dumps. As I mentioned in our Network Plus study group earlier today, brain dumps themselves, I've even downloaded some and looked at them just to see what they're like. Some of the brain dumps don't even have the right answers on them. Like you're cheating. You're using all the same questions from the test. You can't even have somebody smart enough to tell you what the right answers are. You can't trust them. So one of the things that that I can trust is the people that are sponsoring this this user group session that we're doing, this study group session. And that's the folks at GTS Learning with their brand new product called Freestyle. It's actually been out a number of months now. Uh, the Freestyle product is a place that has all of these things all in one place. The book, every the book that they've written for A plus is all online and available to you. All of my videos they put into the book. So as you're reading about CPUs, there's my video. You can also watch about CPUs right there in Freestyle. The best part, I think, is they have tons of questions. They have sample exams. You can have Q&As. You're stepping through the book. You can go through a 100-question sample 701 exam, 100-question 702 exam. Great things there. Let me show you what this looks like. I think I've got one up and running for Freestyle. This is the one I have for the, the Network Plus course, but it is completely laid out. Here I timed out, so let me log back in. It's 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 laid out in the same form as the book. There's a module one, network and media and devices, addressing and routing. Uh, here's network applications, network security. There's a 701 section. There's a 702 section. This one happens to be for Network Plus, but I'm just giving you an example of this. Here is a, here's a section on DHCP and APIPA. 
So I'll just give you a feel for that's like their entire book is right here online. And look, my videos are just right in the middle of all of this. So as you're reading about DHCP, turn this up, you can also see a video before there were about automated CHCP. ways to provide Look at that IP guy. addressing for the devices on your that network. That very attractive DHCP man shows up and tells you all about DHCP. Why, thank you, sir, whoever you are. And all of the graphics from their book are on here. And the thing I like the most, this is probably the, the biggest question I have, is where can I get sample exams? Where can I do Q&A? Here's a practice exam right at the top. You've got 100 questions. For the A+, plus. they have multiple exams you can go through. Very, very nice to be able to have that there. Uh, to learn more about GTS Learning, you can try this for free. Go to professormesser.com slash freestyle, and you can try it out, look through the materials. Uh, they'll give you a sample section you can go into. Some great stuff there. I really like what they've done over at GTS Learning. Um, it's a company that's uh, based around the world. I went to their, their headquarters in the UK when I was out there in November. Great folks to work with. And I appreciate their sponsorship of the study group sessions. They're always sending me information about what they're doing, how they're doing it. I get some insight into the things they're planning. I got to see freestyle before it was even freestyle. Some some really nice things they've got going on. So have a look at that, professormesser.com slash freestyle. Some very good stuff that's there. Well, let's go through some of the questions I get during the month that are about the exam. Because uh because very, very useful to see that 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 part of what people are thinking when I've got to take this exam, but what should I be thinking about when I go to take the exam? <laughs> that, that part's almost as hard as learning the material for the exam itself. So one of the questions was, as an MIS student, this is management information systems. Some of this is IT, same type of thing. It's different names depending on where you are in the world. How does CompTIA A plus fit into my study and career? And it was Ibrahim that sent that question in. I think that, that, the the idea of a certification is not something that should be done in a vacuum. The certification is part it's part of a nutritious breakfast. It's part of all the other things that you're doing in your career. You should absolutely, as an MIS student, at first you've already got the piece that probably most people like to see on a resume, which is formal education. Do you have a degree? What's your degree in? Is it management information systems, which is more of a business degree? Do you have a programming degree? Do you have a, a, a language arts degree? Do you have a degree in biology? Having a four-year degree itself, even if you're not going into the particular area of expertise, is still an important thing to have. It's a, it's a big check mark for people. The certifications are obviously another piece. I need to have certifications to prove that I've gone above and beyond what I normally would get in that four-year or two-year or other type of formal training environment. So certifications have that piece that let the employer know, I'm even more interested in these pieces of it. And I think the third piece, if you can get it, is some practical experience. Being able to show somebody, not only have I gone to formal training, not only do I have certifications, but I've been able to take these certifications and this training and do something with it and learn practical real world experience. It's this nice triangle of things. There's not really an, an equal weighting in the chat room. They're asking, so, so which is, which is better degrees or certification is, is one better than the other? Are they equal? It's hard to say because it, it really depends on who you're talking to and the person who's hiring and what they're looking for. Sometimes you just need somebody to perform a task. we got a big project coming up. It's going to last six months. And I need somebody who knows how to distribute software in Windows 7. Done. He doesn't care how you know it. He doesn't care that you spent four years getting a business degree. He needs somebody to deploy Windows 7. His job's on the line. Other people say, we're hiring. We're a growing company. I need somebody that understands the business side of things and who can understand the requirements we need to be able to handle our help desk. Okay, there's A plus certification. I've got my MIS degree, uh, maybe some extra experience I've spent down at the library, making sure their computers are up and running in their computer lab, that type of thing. Uh, those combination of three things together, I think is, is the primary thing you should focus on. Of course, there's other things during the interview, the conversation you have, the questions that you ask, the way you present yourself. There's so many variables. But if I had to concentrate on three things, it's that formal education, it's the experience you have, and it's these certifications. There is uh, another question I got this month, which was, when will CompTIA A plus be updated to include current technology? This is a question I get 
all the time. I get this question constantly, and I get this question from people, for some reason, that have never looked at the A+. All they know is, oh, A+, that's old. That is some old stuff. There is old things in the A-plus exam. I said, well, there's Windows 7. He said, what? It's Windows 7, A-plus exam? There's IPv6. Huh? There's IPv6. Windows 7 and IPv6. Huh? There's I Yes, there's IPv6, Windows 7 in the A-plus exam. You have to know about IPv6. You have to know about Windows 7. You know, Windows 7 is not old. At least in the chat room, like, Windows 7 is old. Windows 8 is the latest. Windows 8 isn't shipping. Windows 8 is Windows 8 doesn't exist. Windows 8 is vaporware. Windows 8 has not hit the streets and Windows 8 is not going to be on anybody's desktop at an enterprise for quite some time. Windows 7 is the latest cutting edge thing that you need to know out of operating systems. IPv6 is quickly being deployed in many locations and certainly knowing about it is going to help you with IPv4 and it certainly speaks to this. And if you have seen the brand new 800 series of the A-plus exam, virtualization is in there. Tons of security is in there. The latest A-plus exam is the latest current technology. So that's one of those things that I have to look at people and say, come on, Bill, you know what you need to do? You need to go get the exam requirements documents. That is one of the most important things you can do because they just have it. So how would he know? Of course he wouldn't know. Go out to go out to the CompTIA website. Let's open up a browser, CompTIA.org. Go out there. On CompTIA.org, you're going to get an A-plus certification. So go to certifications, and it's going to bring up a big list. Under get certified, let's choose A-plus. A-plus. And on the right side of the screen, it says get started now. See what the exam covers. Click that see what the exam covers. It's going to bring up an exam objectives page for you. Let's put in our information and let's go to the bottom here and choose A plus. Did it put in everything? Maybe it didn't. It did not. Trying to auto-complete everything. And I'm going to put in my networkuptime.com address and we'll put in our U for United States. I think it's USA. Those are the three things you have to say. And let's choose A+. Plus. The exam objectives that come up will be everything you need. So there's a few in here. There's the 22701, 22702. You can also get it in Espanol. And the 801 and 802, even though 801 and 802 is not yet shipping, you can absolutely find that there. So that's, that's there as well. So there is uh, right here where you should go and look at. Let's pull down the, uh, the 801 objectives. Click. I'm in Chrome, so it'll pull them right up on the screen. Here's the 801 objectives. And you can go through and learn everything you're going to need to know about this. So things like FireWire, the USB 3.0, the eSATA, the different types of drives, even the 15,000 RPM drive, solid state information, RAID types, the different CPUs. The, these are all the latest technologies. These are the things you're going to find on the existing pieces of hardware. They're all out there in the exam objectives. And CompTIA does such a good job at giving you every single one of the pieces of information you're going to need to pass the exam. So very, very useful to have that. So if you're wondering how can you help yourself know a little better what to expect, that's how you do it. Go get those exam objectives. It's quite remarkable how many people don't even ever download those exam objectives, and you're going to go take the exam. Wouldn't you want to know what they're going to ask? They write it out pages and pages and pages of detail. Go get it. Go have that available. So one of the questions that came in from Maurice um, was, is there a difference in the exam questions for U.S. and Canada? It's hard being in the United States, not to do a Canada joke here. I think it set me up for one. However, I will have you know that Mrs. Professor Messer has Canadian blood in her, so it would be inappropriate for me to comment. Plus, I've been to Canada so much, and I swear to you some of the nicest people in the world are in Canada. Um, spent some some great time in Ottawa and in Toronto and in Vancouver, so uh, I'm cool with Canada. The differences in the exam question, there are not. Uh, no, no differences at all. There are, uh, it's the same exam. You know, the only, what CompTIA does is they create exams by language. So you'll find there is 
uh, a German exam, a Spanish exam, in the case of the latest A plus Spanish exam and an English exam. That's what we get so far. Uh, and they, they tend to, to roll things out and do things a little bit differently. But in Canada and the U.S., you will tend to get exactly the same exam. Um, there are other exams that are written specifically or, or have a different number, even though they're the A-plus exam. Uh, and there are four organizations that are universities and colleges that are members of CompTIA. They have their own discounted program. So even if it's not the same number, you're even then still getting the same exam. It's just numbered differently. You may not even have a cost for that. And I'm not sure, is there a French exam in Canada? I'm not even sure if the uh, RGPG, are they still? Because right now I thought there was just Spanish and English. They may have rolled out a French exam. And if they are, you can, and you can take these exam, language exams, anywhere you would like. You know, even if you are in Tallahassee, Florida, the world headquarters of Professor Messer, you want to take a Spanish language exam, you absolutely can to be able to do that. So uh, very useful to have that there and be able to, to take those exams and what you can do with them. So, so don't worry about too much about where you are. Worry about where you're going to take the exam. Uh, worry about where you're going to walk in and sit down and take the exam. Some exam locations are fantastic. Some exam locations, eh, not so great. So you may want to check that out before you go. Uh, I've been in some very, very sad exam environments uh, before. And I've been in some absolutely fantastic exam rooms before. Uh, you just have to make sure that you get a good one. So that's that's my my clue. Whether you're in the United States, you're in Canada, just make sure you get a good place for that. Uh, let's move on to our link of the moment. I like to give you one of these every month. And the link from this month is I had that hiring, that top 10 questions at the beginning. And I ran across an interesting thread this week on Reddit, which was, how do you hire your IT professionals? Now, it, this really was a great thread that had a lot of insight into what hiring managers are looking for in IT. So if you go to bit.ly slash IT dash hiring, it will take you right to the Reddit thread in the sysadmin subreddit. Now, if you've never been to Reddit before, uh, just block out some time. It's a fantastic site with so much information there on any particular topic that you would ever want to read. I spend a lot of time in the sysadmin reading about it so I can bring some of these things to you. Um, and and I, I follow a lot of different subreddits. I spend way too much time on Reddit. I try to, I say, I try to tell myself, I get a lot of good information here. Now I get about this much information here. And the rest of the time, I'm, I'm spending good time doing something I should be working on my presentation for my study group meeting. Uh, in this particular case, I love this thread. They go through um, how to find good candidates, how to weed out the bad candidates. What are they looking for? I have been in an interview with someone who said that he was a member of a business fraternity. Said right there on the paper. I'm a, I'm, I'm a part of, I'm a member of this business fraternity. I happen to be in the same business fraternity. I'm doing the interview. And during the interview, I fraternities have this thing where you have a secret word. There's a secret passphrase. And so during the interview, the secret passphrase is not something that sounds obvious, like uh, the raindrops are falling on three shades of midnight. It's not quite so overt like that. It's really something that you can slide into a conversation. And if you recognize it as the passphrase, you can go, oh, yes, I will respond with the response to the passphrase. But if you don't know that it's a passphrase, it just goes on. Well, during the conversation, I threw out the passphrase, he had no idea. So some of the things they talk about in this thread is lying on your resume. Do not lie on your resume. It's a bad idea because I might know that you are lying and you have no idea that I caught you. Something like that. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Don't lie on your resume. Bad idea. Um, how do you determine who's best candidate for the role? And what are some good interview questions? Again, the interview question thing comes up. And it's me, AJ, says, yeah, look at that Yahoo CEO, which is, is it, it, I don't even know what to think of that anymore. At first, you know, the Yahoo CEO who, who let the attribution of his degree go on way too long and did not correct for whatever reason. And then, of course, to find out that he has cancer, um, you know, it's just tragic. It's just it's sad that any of that happened. Plus at Yahoo, which a perfectly good company that has made some very, very bad decisions. Um, don't 
lie on your resume. Uh, very important um, to, to think about how you might go about doing some of those things. So let's do a, a last question here before we finish things up here. My question is one that I'm putting out to you. There's not a wrong question on this one, which is, what topic would you like to, to cover on the next A-plus study group? Now, this gives me an opportunity to know what is it that you would like to know more about. Uh, I do these every month. I ask you for questions, and I keep this enormous database of all your questions. And I pull them out every month, and I stick them on some slides, and we talk about it. This is a good opportunity for me to know what you would like to see in the next A-plus study group. You can text that to... Uh, to 420188 uh, or text 420188, your message 37607. You can submit questions at pollev.com slash messer. So one of the questions, uh, what do we have to memorize for the 800 series A plus exam? Troubleshooting printers, a good one. Thank you. Memory issues. Uh, I actually had a memory issues one ready to go this month. We just ran out of time. I will put that in next month's for sure. Uh, troubleshooting mobile devices. Was the Facebook IPO overhyped? Probably not a question for the for the study group, but a great question just to talk about. One of these days, I'm going to have a call-in show just to talk about things like that. Items related to the 702 test and troubleshooting and the 800 series test and troubleshooting. Absolutely. Removing malware. Boy, that would be a good one. There's so many different tools you can use and things you should think about when removing malware. We should talk about that one. That would be intriguing, especially considering the newest kind of malware out there. Uh, file compression. There's not a lot of questions on file compression on on either the new or the old exam. RAID is uh, one that came up. Boy, I get I get questions about the redundant array of inexpensive or independent disks all the time. Uh, the uh, self study. You know how how do you not be overwhelmed by the study questions? Boy, that's a good question in itself. And I do have some ideas around those. Remote desktop, NTFS, and sharing permissions. I had another set of slides lined up for that that didn't make the cut this time. Obviously, that means I should make the cut next time. Uh, App Locker, uh, virtual operating systems, command prompt. Command prompt happens to be one that I get all the time. So that would be another good one to go through. What I also did, a number of these that have come up, I did last month. Make sure you go back and look at the previous replays of this that are available on professormesser.com. If you go to free A plus, free A P L U S dot com, it will take you to my video index page for A plus. At the bottom are the replays of all of our study group meetings. So you can go through every single one of them. There's different topics that I tend to put on each one of those. So, so very, very useful to be able to, to see that piece. Uh, virtualization, remote support, all very good ones. Fantastic feedback for there on those. I appreciate you guys sending those in. Those are incredibly valuable. I'll put them into my database. We'll absolutely do some of these for next month and have those available. Well, before we go, I want to tell you where to get in touch with me. If you'd like to find me, you can find me on professormesser.com slash Facebook, professormesser.com slash Twitter, professormesser.com slash YouTube slash Google Plus. I just put extra links there. So you can just go to my website slash a place and it will take you to my my world on that place. So that's a good way to get in touch with me. GTS Learning, again, to learn more about freestyle, go to professormesser.com slash freestyle. We appreciate them being sponsors of our monthly study group. And if you ever want to know when we're doing this for sure, you can always go and look on professormesser.com slash calendar. I don't have the June dates up yet, but I absolutely will once I get my life organized. So hopefully that will be soon. Let's cross our fingers. Uh, and I, whenever you want to know, just go out there. I have all the latest updated right there on the online calendar. We appreciate all of you joining us for these. We could not do them without your support, without you being here. I think also being interactive always helps. We had a lot of people in the chat room today. Great feedback and great things here. And uh, we tend to have some great Q&A before, and especially great Q&A after. If you're watching us live, it's another good reason to go out to the calendar. Thanks for joining us for this. Uh, this time, we'll see you next month on another Professor Messer CompTIA A-plus study group.